All right, welcome back to Questing Beast. I am Ben, and today we are looking at Broodmother Sky Fortress. Uh, this is a copy that was sent to me by James Raji to take a look at, and I've been reading it over for the last couple of days, and I'm really excited to show you guys what's inside this thing. Um, it's written by Jeff Reentz, and it won the Judges Spotlight Award at the most recent Ennies. So if you'd like to see why, stick around. So this is an adventure, like most Lamentations books. But it also simultaneously works as a introduction to role playing or as a kind of game master's guide for people who want to get into the OSR. It presents a lot of fundamental principles, mostly through the way that the adventure is structured, which is really fascinating. Jeff Reens is one of the original bloggers in the OSR and is enormously influential. So this is a long time coming. It's a very sturdy book. Um, hardcover. When you open it up, there's no cracking, there's no pages falling out. Like most Lamentations books, extremely sturdy and well put together. And again, like most Lamentations books, it uses the end covers for useful information, or the end papers rather. So we have Outside the Sky Fortress and the Surrounding Cloud. And then on the back, we have Inside the Sky Fortress and underneath it too along with wandering monster tables and so on. So the main premise of this is that there is a sky fortress. It is a giant's city in the clouds, which is kind of a classic trope from fairy tales, except this is populated by uh, giants that are raiding the world below them, trashing things, destroying your campaign world. And it's up to players to try and go up there, find the loot and maybe take out the giants. Although they're intentionally very, very tough. Everything is done in this, um, old 60s cartoon style, which is really refreshing for a Lamentations book. It's great to see all these different styles coming out. That is a reference to a anime cover. I've seen that from somewhere. There's a lot of humor in the illustrations. And you see uh, Jeff, the author, being uh, portrayed in a variety of different guises. So the idea here is to give players, um, to inject players with the attitude that you would need to run Lamentations games or old school games in general. Jeff has been blogging for a very long time and a lot of his um, blog posts form the basis of the OSR. He's one of the first people to articulate a lot of the ideas that became much more mainstream. So it's great to see how he incarnates those ideas in the adventure itself. One of the main principles that he starts with is that you should be willing to wreck your game world. So once you have a campaign set up, this Sky Fortress is going around just trashing it. The, the favorite, uh, your favorite city, your favorite location, it shows up there and just destroys it. You have to give the players the sensation that uh, the world is unstable, nothing is permanent, anything can be destroyed. It gives it that anything goes slightly gonzo feel that a lot of old school games have getting up to the sky fort. This is a giant floating city in the clouds. He gives you a couple possible options, but he points out that a lot of times it's good to set up difficult situations and then don't have a particular plan for players to follow. Players should be clever enough, and usually they are, to figure out ways to overcome even impossible odds. How are they going to get to the top of a uh, castle in the clouds? That's up to them. If your players are like mine, they would find a way. So we look through the different members of the uh, the brood, the giants that are inhabiting this castle. In this case, they are half elephant and half uh, shark and half man. It's a man shark elephant, including the brood mother, kind of an alien type mother depositing eggs, the sword maniac or old beer belly, the chain monster or the brain beast. He does a great job of distinguishing each of the giants with something very unique so that um, once you encounter each of them, they stick in your mind. You can tell them apart very quickly. Vomit Boy, or the Slobbering Moron. The Runt. The Mad Maiden. The Terrible Twins. And a little bit more information on them. So, he also gives you stuff, things you need to work out before you start playing. For example, What's up with these with these ding dang giants anyway? So this is not a adventure where everything is spelled out. 
Instead, what he does is he gives you a wide variety of options, and then he talks you through why you might want that option. What happens if you go in that direction? How are you going to have to reorganize things? In other words, it gets you thinking like a game master, which I think is just fantastic. There is a big dearth of uh, games in the OSR and in RPGs in general that talk you through how a game master thinks. There's lots of tools out there and there's lots of game master manuals, but few that actually walk you through the thought process. And this is what this book does. So angels, for example, or mutants. Or you could have shark elephants, right? There's consequences and pro tips for each of these possibilities. Who built this crazy place? So these giants have taken it over from someone else. Well, who were the original builders? Titans, angels, space gods, or real gods? Each of which has consequences for the adventure. I love these Jack Kirby-esque space gods. That's fantastic. Real gods, like Zeus. Minor issue, the wretches under the tunnels, so there's a lot of mutants living underneath the castle in the clouds that you can deal with. And uh, use this handy list to customize the poor bastards who eke out a meager existence in the tunnels below the Sky Fortress. So it's going to be different every time. So going into the Sky Fortress itself. Monster placement rules, where they're going to be. You can randomize everything, or you can just choose for yourself. Sorry if there's a bit, bit of glare on these pages. They're very high quality and very glossy, but they reflect my light like crazy. Um, that also, I should talk about, the paper quality is awesome. Uh, that's another common thing I'm seeing with a lot of Lamentations books, where they feel really heavy, even if they aren't terribly long, just because the quality is so high. So Wandering Monster Charts, also found at the end pages in the back. Lots of different indoor locations. You've got a Wolverine-type ape here. You got a lot of things that could conceivably throw the entire adventure off course, and I love that. So there's little artifacts that if you messed around with them properly, or you thought about them and used them in a particular way, then everything's going to go to heck real quickly. Things are going to get much more dangerous, much more um, catastrophic, and you're going to have to deal with this uh, new situation that you've brought on to yourself. So there, this is the opposite of a railroady adventure. He intentionally puts a lot of things in here that make it impossible to railroad and would force any um, game master running it to improvise a lot. Because one of the themes that you see running through a lot of OSR adventures is that they should be entertaining for the game master as well. And they should be surprising for them. The crypt, some, some outdoor locations. You have a golden obelisk that attracts uh, lightning and draws it away from actually damaging the area. However, um, it's covered in gold. So the players are going to be very tempted to strip it of all its gold. But if that happens, you've now weakened the enchantment. And the next storm that the place runs through is going to devastate it. You're going to have to deal with the lightning. There's a lot of treasures that are inconvenient, which is great, like statues that could be worth a ton of money to the right person. But they're giant marble statues. So you have to think about the logistics of how you're going to move them. That gets players thinking about, you know, thinking out of the box in terms of how they're going to actually get their money rather than just stacking it into their into their coffers. I love it when players have to rig up things in order to get rich. Things are happening below the ruins. Monster stats. So he gives you some typical OSR stats, like Lamentation stats, that you could use to run this. But he also gives you his own way of running it. So, for example, here's a crazy way. The, there's a thing that you could do. Armor? None. You don't have to roll armor. Um, there's no AC. If you hit, if you attack the monster, you automatically hit them. But it has really strong damage reduction. So players are disincent or um, not incentivized, rather, to just run up and hit the thing over and over because normal weapons aren't going to do much. They're going to have to get much more creative. Maybe drop the monster from huge heights or use powerful spells against it or turn the monsters against each other. Anything that makes a monster um, too powerful to attack in a head-on assault is usually a really good thing. Basically anything that gets the players thinking. A number of crazy malevolent visions. These are all crazy. Six, attack, fi uh, attack ships on fire off the shoulder of Orion. Or let's see, a mutant Tyrannosaurus Rex with a glowing third eye is cast into a steaming lake only to be torn to pieces by hideously fanged piranha mermaids. Or what's some other great ones? The great, the final moments of Ragnarok Zero most of the concept avatars of creation lay dead within the glittering tesseract, leaving only the tiny fragments of surviving concepts we know today. 
The tables in here, here's why the tables are good. Because they don't just give you lots of options. They give you stuff that you probably wouldn't think about yourself while you're playing at the table. And that's the mark of a good random table. It gives you something that you could not improvise. And uh, Jeff is better at this than most people are. So I'd be happy to use all of that. So that's basically the end of the adventure, giving you all these tons of options, ways to customize it, and ways to look at it to make things more interesting, more surprising for you and the players, and ways to force the players to think outside the box to win. That's the hallmark of the OSR, and Jeff does a fantastic job in giving you the tools and explaining to you the mindset that you need to have in order to run things that way. Doing it in the form of an, of an adventure is a fantastic idea. This last section here is basically a collection of some of the best blog posts from Jeff's game blog. And you think, what? It's just a collection of blog posts. But these are great blog posts. They are some of the best. Of course, you could look them up online, but it's great to have them all here where you can easily reference them. Because for someone new to the OSR, this stuff is required reading. A D100 of uh, motivation tables for your PC. Treasure map destinations. Carousing tables. So Jeff is one of the first people to really develop this carousing rule where you gain XP by not just getting gold, but by spending it in huge amounts on ridiculous parties and then rolling on these tables afterwards to see what happens as the result of your party. Usually there's some consequence you have to deal with. And Wizards of the Coast uh, adapted this recently for 5e in one of their um, uh, recent Unearthed Arcanas. Maybe it ended up in the new book too. I'm not sure. I haven't read that yet. More carousing mishaps. The Living Dungeon. 20 quick questions for your campaign setting. So you're starting a new campaign. Run through this and you get a clear grasp on the important aspects of your world that you would need to run a game. It isn't a detailed world building list, but what it does is it, it tells you what you would need to know to run a D&D game, which isn't quite the same as building a really fleshed out world. For example, what's the deal with my cleric's religion? Who is the mightiest wizard in the land? These are the sort of things that players would actually think about. Which way to the nearest tavern? Are there any wars brewing I could go fight? And so on. How to get started doing old schooling. Wandering monsters and how those work. How to do gain XP through exploration. You also have seen um, Wizards of the Coast adapt this for 5th edition. In, in the recent update to the XP rules where you can gain experience by visiting new locations. Jeff did it first. How morale works. Ways to use strength and dexterity. Basically, it's a compilation of some great advice combined with really interesting house rules that, again, give you an insight into the mind of a really good GM and how they think and how there is a healthy disrespect for the rules that you see really commonly among the OSR. And that, I think, is one of the big differentiations between the OSR and a lot of 5e players who are very by the book and are trying to find combos and work within the rules to exploit them in some way, which of course can be fun on its own. But the OSR has this inherent disrespect for the rules where the rules are yours. Not only can you tweak the rules, you can throw them out and rewrite them as you wish. And you shouldn't be terrified of unbalancing the game. You should be focused on what would be more fun. Try something. If it doesn't work, try something else but really make it your own. How to awesome up your players. This is one of my favorite articles. Oh, and this is, the last bit is the Grimoires of Wessex, which is one of the funniest articles. So what he does is his spell books are actual books. They have names, for example, the Book of Austenes, the Magi, and it has the language that it's in, ancient Greek, translated from ancient Persian, because he was running a game that was set in our world or a fictional version of our world. And it has the period that it came from, uh, 4th century BC. And each one has a heresy built into it. Because since it's set in a fictional version of our universe, then Christianity and Catholicism is a real thing, and because it's, it's set in the medieval period. And so a spell book is going to be inherently heretical in some sense. So he builds a heresy into each of the books, which are really funny. And really show that the author does have a background in this sort of thing, in history. So this one has the blasphemy. Good and evil are evenly matched. In the end, they will destroy each other and everything else. Or that Adam was the first wizard. Or things like that. 
which is funny if you're a student of theology and history. There we go. We've got a hundred of them. So that's Broodmother Sky Fortress. Basically, should you buy this book? If you're already really familiar with Jeff's stuff, then the um, half of the book you may have read already. However, if you are a new player, if you're curious about Lamentations, if you're curious about old school games, this is pretty much the ideal place to start in terms of giving you an adventure that pushes everything that's OSR directly into your hands and gives you concrete advice on how to use it and then gives you a lot of advice at the back about the OSR in general. So all in all, top marks for this. I would strongly recommend it if you are new to the OSR. And even if you're an experienced player, um, this book is a really fun time to read. Usually it takes me a long time to read these books, but I cracked this open and I just sat down to skim through it a bit. And like four hours later, I had read the whole thing front to back, which never happens to me with RPG books. So it is an entertaining read and incredibly useful. So that's it. Broodmother Sky Fortress, I will put links down in the description below where you can check it out. It, you can get it in hard copy and of course in PDF. And uh, if you'd like to see more videos like this, please remember to subscribe to my channel. And uh, thanks for watching, everybody. I'll see you guys later.